So thank you all for joining me this morning for today's uh, Heroes on Zoom episode from Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge's wonderful book, Hero Tales. Uh, we've been through quite a few stories at this point and one theme after another sort of comes out. Uh, the last session on Tuesday, we talked about General Grant and the siege of Vicksburg, the taking of Vicksburg. Now we're going to talk about a Union officer uh, whose uh, big moment in history happens during another siege, the siege of Charleston. Uh, a, a unsuccessful siege of a fortified southern city. But a lot of Robert Gould Shaw's story also reflects that earlier uh, hero tale about John Quincy Adams. Because Robert Gould Shaw is a man who is largely defined by his sincere abolitionism. He is a Union officer uh, motivated by the desire to end slavery. Now, it's important to understand that if you joined the Union Army in 1861 as an abolitionist, it was sort of an act of faith that sooner or later the Union government would become abolitionist because for the first more than a year of the war, uh, the Union was saying that freeing the slaves was not a aim of the war. But Robert Gould Shaw did join early, become an officer and gain some command experience uh, before the period that made him famous. Now, whenever we've kicked off one of these hero tales, I appreciate, I really like the way that Cabot and Lodge uh, choose to begin with a few verses from a poem each time. You know what? I'm going to skip that this time and return to it a little bit later. But I'm also doing today's session out in the gallery to remind you that we're a real museum with a physical location and that uh, there's many enriching things for these stories that are actually out here on display in the gallery. In particular today, here is the subject of today's talk, uh, Robert Gould Shaw. And Robert Gould Shaw, this particular image of him came out of the South Carolina Historical Society down in Charleston. And here in our fight for freedom case. We also see the type of sword he would have been issued, the US Model 1850 Staff and Field Officer's Sword, a regulation book from the 55th Massachusetts. Now he commanded the 54th Massachusetts. This is sort of their sister regiment. And most importantly, biggest reason I pulled us out into the gallery today is a nice overhead view, a map of what wartime Charleston looked like. And we will return to that. Robert Gould Shaw was born in Boston on October 10th, 1837, the son of Francis and Sarah Sturgis Shaw. About nine years old, his parents moved to Staten Island and he was educated there and at school in the neighborhood of New York until he went to Europe in 1853, where he remained traveling and studying for the next three years. He entered Harvard College in 1856 and left at the end of his third year to accept an advantageous business offer. Even as a boy, he took much interest in politics and especially in the question of slavery. He voted for Lincoln in 1860, and at that time enlisted as a private in the New York 7th Regiment. Well, he would be identified as a college educated man and a good leader 
uh, and commissioned as an officer and actually fought uh, at Cedar Mountain and uh, at, in other battles in which he gained further experience of the, the bloody business of the front. And then he would take an offer. Uh, he wouldn't take it without though some careful thought. The war begins, remember, um, with the firing on Fort Sumter in, Sumter in April of 1861. A year later, in April of 1862, uh, there's been no official Union government policy about slavery. Um, that autumn, however, in between, in the autumn of 1861, uh, part of South Carolina was captured and down around Beaufort and the islands down there. Some slaves were enlisted, some former slaves were enlisted as soldiers in the US Army. This is their flag behind us here, the last surviving flag of those troops. But there's no official policies regarding um, uh, ending slavery. And then the Emancipation Proclamation comes in January of 1863. And that changes a lot of things. One of the things it changes now is there is now the possibility of raising segregated regiments. And up until this point, black men had not been um, recruited into the Union Army in the North. Early in 1863, the government determined to form black regiments and Governor Andrew offered Shaw who had now risen to the rank of captain, the colonelcy of one to be raised in Massachusetts. That's a big jump. That's a big opportunity and promotion from a captain who's a company commander straight to a full colonel. That's a three rank jump, commanding a regiment of 10 companies. It was a great compliment to receive this offer, but Shaw hesitated as to his capacity for such a responsible post. He first wrote a letter declining he said no. On the ground, he did not feel he had ability enough and then changed his mind and telegraphed the governor that he would accept. It's not easy to realize it now. Uh, Roosevelt and Lodge write in their editorializing here a bit. Not easy to realize it now, but his action then in accepting this command required high moral courage of a kind quite different from that which he had displayed already on the field of battle. So I mentioned already that I, I think of this as being a little bit like the Vicksburg essay about General Grant and a little bit like the John Quincy Adams essay about a man who showed moral courage to stand up for the right thing in a way that was not physically dangerous. Before Robert Gould Shaw gets around to the physical danger of battle, first he has to face a struggle inside the army itself, a struggle with himself. Do I have the confidence to command an entire regiment? I've only commanded a hundred guys. Now you're talking about a thousand. Um, but beyond that, as they write here, the prejudice against the blacks was still strong, even in the North. And remember they're writing this in the 1890s. There was a great deal of feeling among certain classes against enlisting black regiments at all. And the officers who undertook to recruit and lead them were exposed to much attack and criticism. Shaw felt, however, that this very opposition made it all the more incumbent on him to undertake the duty. This is from one of Shaw's letters. After I have undertaken this work, I shall feel that what I have to do is prove that the Negro can be made into a good soldier. I am inclined to think that the undertaking will not meet with so much opposition as was at first supposed. All sensible men in the army of all parties, after a little thought, say it is the best thing that can be done. And surely those at home who are not brave or patriotic enough to enlist should not ridicule or throw obstacles in the way of men who are going to fight for them. 
There is a great prejudice against it, but now that it has become a government matter, that will probably wear away. At any rate, I shan't be frightened out of it by unpopularity. I feel convinced I shall never regret having taken this step, as far as I myself am concerned. For while I was undecided, I felt ashamed of myself as if I were cowardly. There's a comment on moral courage. Um, this man has faced battle and particularly at Cedar Mountain uh, has been in great danger in combat. And yet he, he doubts his own courage when it comes to peer pressure and criticism and unpopularity. But he meets that test. He breaks through it and determines um, how, he, how he put it um, to make these men good soldiers. Colonel Shaw went at once to Boston after accepting his new duty and began the work of raising and drilling the 54th Regiment. He met with great success for he and his officers labored heart and soul and the regiment repaid their efforts. Well, his regiment, uh, and an important thing to realize about the very famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment, and there was a movie some years ago in which Matthew Broderick, who does not look a lot like Colonel Shaw, portrayed him. Um, but it's important to realize this regiment was raised entirely from free men in the North. No soldier in the 54th Massachusetts was a former slave. These were people their parents had ridden the Underground Railroad, they'd grown up, uh, been educated and enlisted in the North. And before leaving for South Carolina, which is where they're gonna fight, they had a parade in Boston. And that was a memory that stuck with Colonel Shaw and that he chose to write about. The more I think of the passage of the 54th through Boston, the more wonderful it seems to me. Just remember our own doubts and fears and other people's sneering and pitying remarks when we began last winter, and then look at the perfect triumph of last Thursday. We have gone quietly along forming the first regiment and at last left Boston amid greater enthusiasm than has ever been seen since the first three months troops left for the war, truly. I ought to be thankful for all my happiness and my success in life so far. And if the raising of colored troops proves such a benefit to the country and to the blacks as many people think it will, I shall thank God a thousand times that I was led to take my share in it. Now he hasn't gone into battle with these men yet, but he is a combat veteran who's confident that they've been brought up to the quality they need to be to face battle. And he feels like th their training and getting the regiment ready has already made a huge contribution and frustrated the doubters in the Northern Army and, and among the population. He had indeed taken his share in striking one of the most fatal blows to the barbarism of slavery, which had yet been struck. The formation of the black regiments, and again, this is Roosevelt and Lodge's words, the formation of the black regiments did more for the emancipation of the Negro and the recognition of his rights than almost anything else. It was impossible after that to say that men who fought and gave their lives for the Union and for their own freedom were not entitled to be free. The acceptance of the command of a black regiment by such men as Shaw and his fellow officers was the great act that made all this possible. So this essay about a leader who falls in battle is mostly really about his moral battle. And a few years later, just a couple of years really after writing this book, Theodore Roosevelt is going to work with a similar man. When Theodore Roosevelt leads his own regiment of soldiers in the Spanish-American War, right next to him will be a regiment, a segregated regiment of black American soldiers commanded by white officer John J. Pershing. Pershing's going to get the nickname Black Jack for his work with those troops. And right next to the Rough Riders are those Buffalo soldiers. And Roosevelt's going to say something very similar about those men that he says right here. 
right here where he says, men who fought and gave their lives for the union and their own freedom were entitled to be free. And after the Spanish-American War, he's going to say that a man who fights for his country, no matter his color, is entitled to a square deal afterwards. So that gets our protagonist down to Charleston, which is where they're sent. After reaching South Carolina, Colonel Shaw was with his regiment at Port Royal on the islands of the coast for more than a month. And on July 18th, he was offered the post of honor in an assault upon Fort Wagner. Let's see if we can get a good look at what that means. So moving from Port Royal to Charleston now. Charleston, of course, is a harbor. And the defenses of that harbor are very, very extensive. Right, the forts surrounding the harbor, I'm trying to get a, move the camera and point stuff out at the same time. One second here. Okay, there we go. Now we can see, I hope, most of the map. Okay, here's the harbor. A, a places guarding the harbor include Fort Moultrie, Fort Sumter, Fort Johnson, Castle Pinckney, the battery in Charleston itself and various other points. But one fortified island is Morris Island. And it is on Morris Island that the 54th will make its attack toward this point. So there's Morris Island. And they're going to make their most famous attack toward Battery Wagner. Okay, so here's the entrance to Charleston right here. Here's, you can tell the Morris Island is very important to be able to get into the city. And there is Battery Wagner. He was offered the post of honor in an assault upon Fort Wagner. Beware that phrase, the post of honor in the 1860s usually refers to the most dangerous spot on the battlefield. Wherever the danger is greatest, that is the post of honor. He was offered the post of honor in an assault upon Fort Wagner, which was ordered for that night. He had proved that the Negroes could be made into a good regiment. And now the second great opportunity had come to prove their fighting quality, writes Roosevelt. Um, he wanted to demonstrate that his men could fight side by side with white soldiers and show somebody besides their officers what stuff they were made of. He therefore accepted the dangerous duty with gladness. Late in the day, the troops were marched across Folly and Morris Island and formed in line of battle within 600 yards of Fort Wagner. At half past seven, the order for the charge had been given and the regiment advanced. When they were within 100 yards of the fort, the rebel fire opened with such effect that the 1st Battalion hesitated and wavered. Colonel Shaw sprang to the front and waving his sword shouted, forward 54th. With another cheer, the men rushed through the ditch and gained a parapet on the right. Colonel Shaw was one of the first to scale the walls. As he stood erect, a noble figure ordering his men forward and shouting to them to press on. He was shot dead and fell into the fort. After this fall, the assault was repulsed. Returning to the bit of poetry they opened with this time, the second verse, right in the van, that's the front, the vanguards in front, right in the van. Right in the van on the red rampart slippery swell, with heart that beat a charge, he fell forward as fits a man. But the high soul burns on to light men's feet, where death for noble ends makes dying sweet. His life, her crescent span, orbs full with share in their undarkening days. Who ever climbed the Vitalius steeps of praise since valor's praise began? He fell forward as fits a man. That's just a wonderful phrase uh, that Colonel Shaw 
uh, was not shot down while retreating or even while standing, but while pushing himself forward and leading the charge so that he literally fell into the fort. And his remains today, by the way, are in Beaufort National Cemetery with those of many of his soldiers disinterred from Morris Island. So, Robert Gould Shaw fell in battle at the head of his men, giving his life for his country, as did many another gallant man during those four years of conflict. But he did something more than this. He faced prejudice and hostility in the North and confronted the blind and savage rage of the South in order to demonstrate to the world that the human beings who were held in bondage could vindicate their right to freedom by fighting and dying for it. He had all that birth and wealth, breeding, education, and tradition could give. That's something that would have meant a lot to Roosevelt and Lodge, all of those things that, that went into making them the people that they were. They were in higher classes of society. Education and tradition they see as strengths. And um, that would include, of course, Shaw's education in, and traditions of his faith that instructed him. He offered up in full measure all those things that make life most worth living. He has been singled out for remembrance from among many others of equal sacrifice. I'm going to pop up a little tribute here as he talks about the monument that's going to be raised. Let's look at what it turned out to be like. A monument is rising to his memory in Boston because it was his peculiar fortune to live and die for a great principle of humanity and to stand forth as an ideal and beautiful figure in a struggle where the onward march of civilization was at stake. And here we see the monument in Boston recently refurbished. Let's get a close look. Here we have Shaw on horseback next to his men. And what's being portrayed here is the parade that he wrote about uh, in the letter that we quoted earlier. And there's a close up of uh, Shaw and his men in bar relief on this monument. He lived in those few and crowded years a heroic life and he met a heroic death. When he fell sword in hand on the parapet of Wagner, leading his black troops in a desperate assault, we can only say of him, as Bunyan said, of valiant for truth. And then he passed over and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. And you can still see that monument in Boston to this day. So there's a story uh, that mingles a couple of the themes that we've seen in the American Hero Tales, among others. Uh, and this one is a story of a man with both physical and moral courage, but it's the moral courage that the authors chose to emphasize in the story of Robert Gould Shaw. Okay, um, I've taken 25 minutes where I am supposed to take 15, but y'all are used to that by now. Uh, did anybody have any questions before we wrap up today? Um, for why why would there be a castle? Why would there be a castle? Okay, uh, if you saw what Castle Pinckney looked like, um, you would probably name it Fort Pinckney instead. Um, the fact that it's named Castle Pinckney does not mean that it looked like a medieval castle. Uh, it did not. It did not. And by the way, it's still there. It's not in very good shape, uh, but the foundations and part of the property are still there. Uh, and happily, the man who owns it today is a Citadel graduate who, who cares about preserving it. Um, but yeah, that it was one more fortification. Anything else? Um, what about Fort Sumter? Was that even there? What? Uh, was it there? Like Fort Sumter? Was it there? Was Fort Sumter there? 
Oh yeah, did, absolutely. Just skip completely? Yeah, there's a, there's a whole ring of forts. Let me try to catch them all in the light here. Okay, here we got the harbor itself, but forts were located there, 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 there. That one in the middle is Fort Sumter. There, 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 here and also in some additional places were cannons. So the idea was that anything approaching Charleston would come under fire from more than one direction. It was very effective. Although our essay did not emphasize it, it was talking about the heroism of Shaw. The attack on Battery Wagner was a failure um, and all of the attacks on the defenses of Charleston failed until January of 1865 when uh, General Beauregard gave orders to pull all the troops out of Charleston up to Columbia. And only then after the Confederates had left uh, was the Union able to capture the city. So the forts are very strong. And Fort Sumter, remember, is there at the very beginning of the war. That's usually considered the first shots is the firing on Fort Sumter. It's captured by the Confederates and the Union spends the next three years trying to capture it back. So that fort was almost continuous fighting during the war. Um, and it's still there to be seen. <laughs>